Hello, everybody, and welcome to those of you who are here in the room, in person, in the flesh, and also to those of you who are watching online. My name is Pat Parody. I'm the recently retired executive director of the Centre for Constitutional Studies at the University of Alberta, and I'm also a board director on the Parkland Board. I feel very honoured and pleased to have been asked to present Riley Esno's talk today. Her talk, Beyond Recognition Towards uh, Liberated Futures, is one that I know I'm very anxious to hear about. Riley Esno is a queer Anishinaabe scholar, writer, and advocate from the Ibomitung First Nation. She's been a contributor and commentator for some of the largest media outlets in Canada and the world, including the New York Times, BBC World News, The Globe and Mail, and CBC National News. Riley has also traveled the globe, speaking at internationally renowned institutions and events, including the UN Climate Negotiations, the Stockholm Forum on Gender Equality, TEDx Stages, and many others. Her major project right now is to finish her PhD at the University of Toronto, where she studies Indigenous Canadian politics and is a Vanier scholar. Her love and gratitude for her communities, passion for radical ideas, and the calls she feels to challenge systems in what is what inspires her work. So without further ado, Riley. Thank you, I figure I'll introduce myself to you first, lay my cards on the table so you have a sense of what you're going to um, expect here. I come from Abmatung First Nation, which if you know Ontario geography at all, if you know where Thunder Bay is, go about 400 kilometers north and you're in Abmatung territory. So um, it's a reserve. Um, it's the community in Canada with the second longest boil water advisory in the country. It's a community of about a thousand-ish people that live in on reserve. Grew up mostly in Thunder Bay and, and now I'm in Toronto. So I'm a girl of the Great Lakes through and through. And then I'll tell you a little bit about who I'm accountable to, um, where my knowledge largely comes from. I also consider myself a bit, or I've been told, and, and I've now taken it to be part of my identity, <laughs> a bit of a troublemaker. When I was uh, 16, years old, I was appointed to the Prime Minister's Youth Council to work with Justin Trudeau. And at the time, I had been like really sold on this idea that like elected politics was the change-making vehicle. That's where everything happens. You just got to get a seat at the table and then you can make changes. And then I got there. It like all crashed and burned around me. <laughs> I realized what a romantic vision of change making that was, especially as a young indigenous woman in that room, so often not listened to, so often uh, taken for granted, all of these things. And so I became like a bit of like what I now consider a recovering anarchist, where I was like, okay, I guess then no change is possible, blah, 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 this is terrible. And then it was, Indigenous people and specifically youth and elders and community organizers who like picked me up by the collar of my shirt, dusted me off and like put me back out there and said, no, change is possible if not in the way that you thought it was. Um, that there are people who are doing this work and who have been doing this work and there's organizing knowledge for you to inherit um, and it's your job to take it up, um, that that is your birthright. They really redeemed me, I felt, and put me on this path of this radical sort of change making. That kind of gives me the basis of what you're going to see in here, which is not solutions from the state. <laughs> it's not going to be about how we just need to elect more indigenous people into parliament and then there we go, we've done, well, reconciliation thereafter will follow. Um, it's going to cause you to maybe think in a little bit more of a transformative way, um, a more challenging way than I think we're often um, asked to. So beyond recognition or reconciliation and towards liberation, I think they're different things. And this is a picture I took actually outside of, on U of T campus, someone spray painted this on the sidewalk and said, colonialism does not spark joy. And I said, no, it does not. I thought that was a great image to use. 
First, what is reconciliation? Since 2015, reconciliation has been the dominant word and term we've used uh, to talk about our future goals for Indigenous affairs, right? Followed the TRC, which followed the 2006 class action for IRS. It's been kind of everywhere ever since and only growing in popularity. When I ask people to define what reconciliation actually means, <laughs> especially for non-Indigenous folks like this, uh, 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 and they don't really can't actually paint me a picture of what that means to them, right? It's kind of an ambiguous word, and I think it's done purposefully so that you're supposed to be able to project um, a whole bunch of different meanings onto it. And that's something that I'm gonna argue works really well for in both positive and, and negative ways. My sense is, is that there's not really a consensus on, on what reconciliation actually is. If you had to paint a picture of it, what it would look like. The data somewhat agrees with me. So this is from uh, the Canadian Reconciliation Barometer that's done out of, it's either U Winnipeg or U Manitoba. This is from their infographic from 2021 that was trying to get a sense of what are the perceptions of reconciliation between indigenous and non-Indigenous people, right? And so they do it in a whole bunch of factors. I note that it excludes the territories from their analysis, so those aren't included in this data. You can see, like, percentage who say residential schools harmed Indigenous people, a 20% plus gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. People in Canada understand and acknowledge past and current harms caused by residential schools, but that there is this huge gap between non-Indigenous and Indigenous people across all of the points, and that Canadians know Indigenous people face inequality but they disagree about how deep that inequality is. So not only do they not have a sense necessarily of what reconciliation is, but they don't even have the same sense necessarily of what it is they're trying to fix or how urgent it needs to be fixed, right? Which is worrisome when we're trying to get collective action together to do something. Um, this is across Canada, these um, stats, but the disparity is, is grows between um, region and income levels. As your income levels increase, that respondents think that the inequality is less bad. Particularly, I don't know if this will surprise folks in the room, but the, the largest disparities across all the points are, are in the prairies between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. This is how um, the general public thinks about reconciliation, kind of at a glance, at 3,000 feet. But what did the TRC say, right, as like the benchmark document for reconciliation? I did a textual analysis to, to try and see um, what survivors, in their own words, what the commissioners, in their expertise, they articulated reconciliation as being. I put the most important parts there in red. The TRC came to define reconciliation as a process meant to establish and maintain mutually respectful relationships. The requisites for that, to meet that objective, were accountability for the harm, atonement for causes, action to change behavior. And then there were principles to guide those things that needed to happen. Political will, joint leadership, trust building, accountability and transparency, as well as a substantial investment of resources. And so what I want to emphasize with those articulations, right, is it's very material. There's a level of urgency and actionability in all of those words. So that's a TRC. Then I asked myself, okay, what did the government actually want the TRC to do? And so then I went and found Stephen Harper's mandate letter to the TRC of what they wanted the TRC to produce. This is what Stephen Harper's government said they wanted from the TRC. They wanted something to acknowledge residential schools. They wanted to promote awareness and public education. They wanted to support commemoration. And I think very starkly, you know, where the TRC ultimately produced 94 calls to action, they wanted recommendations. And so some people might squabble with me and say, you know, like this language is, is um, you know, just language or just words on a page, but I think that they convey a deeper symbolic meaning, right? Where if you read between the lines of what survivors said, they said, this is urgent. We need material investments. We need huge amounts of will and collaboration. And the government said, um, we're okay with um, something a little bit more fluffy. Um, <laughs> We're okay with symbolism. We're okay with um, acknowledging, but that doesn't mean doing necessarily, right? Um, I think we were meant to assume that that would come with the acknowledgement.
Another person who might pick an argument with me might say that, you know, it doesn't matter if that's what Stephen Harper's government said, so long as what we actually did following the TRC matches what survivors wanted, right? Like the government um, might have had a vision, but that doesn't mean that that's ultimately what happened. So what does Canada look like in 2022? I went to the lobby of U of T's Sydney Smith Hall, and if folks know U of T at all, and U of T campus is a huge, diverse campus, Sydney Smith is like the main arts and science building. And I asked a whole bunch of people that walked through if they would tell me what they thought, what, when they, I said Indigenous Affairs in Canada in 2022, what did, what did they think of? And they said, every child matters. They said they see them on Facebook, on people's you know, profile picture banners. They said land acknowledgements, and then it would either prompt about how they had no idea about Indigenous land, often if they were international students, or they said that they thought that they were meaningless and they've been useless things. A little bit of a debate there on land acknowledgements. They talked about the unmarked graves and how um, the flag debate was half mass. Somebody brought up, and I was so glad they did. I thought I was the only one that was annoyed by it when the prime ministerial debates were going on at the last election, and they had a whole section of the debates on reconciliation, and like it suddenly turned into like when should we put the flag down from half mast and when should we keep it up? And that was like the policy discussion around reconciliation was this flag. People said that they've read some books by Indigenous authors that they really like. Um, and people said that they were impressed that we've elected more Indigenous representatives to Parliament. A lot of people also had like nothing to say. Some people had more than others. But these are just the big things that I, I also see, too. I don't point them out to say that any of those things are bad, right, obviously. That having critical conversations about land acknowledgments, good things. Talking about symbolism, reading more books, these are all good things. But I also, as I mentioned off the top, am an Indigenous person that comes from the longest boil water advisory in the country. What do these things necessarily do for me, right, on the day to day and day out? Not much. And it doesn't for many other Indigenous people. Maybe we have actually reached Stephen Harper's goals of promoting commemoration and awareness and education, um, but how has that materially transformed for Indigenous people? So let's look at more things. The main critique Indigenous people have had of reconciliation, I find, are twofold. So one is that inaction has defined the reconciliation process to date. So this is from the Yellowhead Institute, which if folks don't know them, I highly encourage you to look them up. They're a public policy think tank out of uh, Toronto Metropolitan, formerly Ryerson University. They make these updates on accountability to the calls to action. I believe it's 11 calls to action of the 94 have been completed at this rate of completion. And it's not set to be done until like 2084 or something like that, when all of the survivors of the residential school system will very, very likely have passed. Also in 2021 was the most action we've seen on the TRC call to date, three of them in one year, and they were all around unmarked graves, which is a you know, good thing, a fulfill a TRC check, good. But why did it take that mass uncovering for them to get any sort of investment in action? They were in the TRC, those calls to action, since 2015. They called for the money in 2015, um, and it took, it took a mass public um, response for them to actually start mobilizing, right, the government. And then also when we look at what are called the legacy calls within the calls to action, so those are supposed to be like huge, massive, more substantial changes than, you know, national holidays per se. Only three of those have been completed. One of them, the MMIWG inquiry, it was a huge, you know, truth telling process, but also has had zero of the 231 calls that they produced now implemented, right? We're seeing a lot of, of commissions and reports and, and symbolism again, and not much of substance. And also contradiction. You know, in 2015, Justin Trudeau very now infamously said, the most important relationship to me is the one with Indigenous people, right? And Indigenous people have never forgotten that because we turn and look at our surroundings and look at the politics that have evolved since that day and said, we're your most important relationship? <laughs> because we saw here, this is a still from the Wet'suwet'en pipeline protest that happened, and we saw elders and land defenders um, removed forcibly and violently by the RCMP. We saw 1492 Land Back Lane where condo developers and, and big business encroached on indigenous territory um, and resulted again in destruction and violence. This is a portrait of Joyce Echequan, who folks might remember live streamed her death in a hospital in Quebec um, because of the mistreatment of the healthcare system and the racism in the healthcare system. We said we're living in the day and age of reconciliation. 
were your most important relationship. At a certain point, indigenous people got really fed up. So there's this profound disconnect and what do we do about it? And indigenous people, what they started to say was, reconciliation is dead. And folks might have heard that in 2020 around what Soatin is, is when I think it really started to repel. There's been not a lot, I think, of, of governmental uh, sort of take up of that, right, of that critique, which I would think if I was in a position of leadership and the people who my whole policy agenda was geared towards says, this isn't working for me anymore, it's dead, that I would have to sit and say, whoa, okay, like we have to sit and talk and think about this and, and think about what, we, what our approach needs to be doing instead. That has not happened. Instead, billions and tens of billions of dollars earmarked for reconciliation um, continue to be put in every budget. For any politically science-minded folks out there, I really want someone to make this like path-dependent argument too and, and cost benefit uh, sort of argument where we've created a bit of a reconciliation economy as well, right? Like people's entire, um, you know, salaries in some cases are paid on the basis of reconciliation dollars. So even though reconciliation might be failing us, um, the, it seems to cost a lot for the government to now deviate from this path that they've committed to. Um, and so that I think is a big, big problem. Reconciliation and recognition. Maybe the boldest argument I'm gonna make here for you is not just that things are bad, but that they were always intended to be this bad is kind of what I'm getting at. The Yellowhead Institute said, hard work on the symbols, avoiding the substance. They basically are summarizing the argument I've given to you here. And I wanna turn it a bit to political theory of Fanon and Glenn Coulthard. Glenn Coulthard is a Dene political theorist who I think everybody should read and it's a little bit dense, but it's very good. Fanon and Coulthard similarly argue that the terms of recognition, reconciliation, we recognize there's been some wrongdoing, are often determined by the hegemonic group, Canada, the government of Canada, and their interests, and then the oppressed group, indigenous people, deceived into thinking they're being offered a pathway to liberation, come to depend on these effective attachments. So those actions taken in the name of reconciliation. I've come to really believe this because for indigenous young people, especially like myself, who were so actually happy to see reconciliation is dead take off because we were like, finally, that speaks to this like, you know, feeling that we've had that what is supposed to be for us isn't actually working, that this is you know, not serving us. Um, we got told we were disrespecting survivors. Uh, we got told that we um, were just angry, didn't want a better future. We were just going to kind of spit on the work of others. Instead of seeing dissent and criticism as an important part of being alive, right? Of a community that's thinking critically every day about their conditions and about their future. This is to say anti-colonial scholars would make the argument that the move toward recognition is deliberate. It's deliberate because if you see land acknowledgements, if you see Facebook banners, it creates the illusion that we're doing something, that we're talking about things, even if we're not actually doing something under the surface. And very few people, I think, will spend the necessary time or relationship or conversations to, to get that sense. Um, but they're like, aren't things getting better? We're doing so much more than we did five years ago. And maybe representatively, we are. But um, substantively, I would say that we're not. Indigenous people are doing something about this. They're not just, you know, sitting around theorizing about it. Indigenous thinkers have a lot of visions about the way forward. So to get some principles out there, Glenn Coulthard says that the solution is going to look basically different for Indigenous nations, that the approach to liberation has to be grounded in the teachings and the knowledge of a specific place and of a specific people. That the, to even attempt, I think, is what I got from this, to create some sort of, like, cross-Canada umbrella reconciliation thing was always going to fail because it's not grounded in these places and these individual contexts. Leanne Simpson writes that decolonization and liberation must take place on our own terms without the sanction, permission, or engagement of the state, Western theory, opinions of Canadians. And I would love that we would do it and then they'd come along anyways. <laughs> that everyone would really just love it and see how great it was <laughs> and come along anyways. But that ultimately it can't be premised on, on the approval of non-Indigenous people. Indigenous people on the ground are organizing. Have you heard of Landback? Landback, for folks who don't know, was actually created on Instagram 
in 2018 by a Cree meme creator named Arnell Tailfeathers. I wish I had the image, it's, it's really ridiculous um, and funny. He had a really popular meme page and indigenous people everywhere, it like kind of hit a spot for us, right? And it suddenly it was everywhere, it was exploding. It was in indigenous rap songs and it was in indigenous art and then people were naming 1492 Land Back Lane after Land Back. It spoke to something that indigenous people had long wanted um, in a way that reconciliation, especially at the time, did not. And so this is how I've come to define land back. Land back, in my view, is any action that supports affirming or returning the jurisdiction, authority, and resources that have been attacked by colonization into the hands of indigenous people. These may be individual actions, but they will serve a larger common goal of indigenous sovereignty and liberation from settler colonial domination. So it's not about commemoration. It's not about promoting awareness. It's about materiality, and materiality in service of indigenous people. It emerged at a very opportune time as land back was on the rise. Reconciliation, I think, was on decline. If this is the first time you've heard about it, that I would argue that it probably won't be the last because it kind of speaks to this general spirit of discontent that's evergreen so long as we live under settler colonialism, right? Um, where reconciliation waxes and wanes with different governments, land back um, the idea that indigenous people deserve sovereignty and authority and power is something that, that stays, right? And land back is for everyone. So two things. One, whenever I talk about land back, the settler sort of like urge is, does this mean I'm getting like kicked off my land and <laughs> you're all gonna like take me out and then basically send us all back to wherever, you know, our ancestors might have came from. I always return that no, in, in, in short, that <laughs> indigenous people are a people that know displacement very well. We're not looking to replicate the same systems of harm and domination that have been done with us. And I think it's a very colonial assumption um, that uh, you know, if we had power, we're gonna do the same thing to you that you did to us, right? Um, is where people's minds already go. And I think that's a symptom of, of colonization in itself, that all we know as a possibility of power is violence, is destruction, um, is, you know, uh, authority. And it's not something more collaborative or reciprocal or loving, which is how I always understood indigenous visions uh, of settler indigenous relations on this land. And also, I will add that as we look down the looming climate crisis and we talked earlier today at the very beginning of the day about how this was you know like an apocalyptic situation for all people that I would offer that indigenous people offer us the, the best path forward and there's some evidence to prove this um, the UN found that uh, indigenous people make up about five percent of the global population we protect over 80 percent of the world's remaining biodiversity um, indigenous people uh, also in North America alone by protesting pipelines. Um, indigenous climate action found that in 2020, that was responsible for mitigating up to 25% of North American GHG emissions. 5% um, of the population putting 25% of GHG emissions on their back, putting 80% of biodiversity on their back. If we're looking for solutions to the climate crisis, indigenous people are already embodying them, right? Is kind of the point. And land back, if they were in charge of the lands, of laws of the lands, of authority, would be able to do those things much more easily without looking down the barrel of a gun, right? <laughs> With this, comes a warning, is that I think we need to be able to learn from reconciliation's mistakes. And so the first of those big mistakes was co-option. So is that survivors went into the reconciliation process with a very clear, a very honest vision of what reconciliation would look like. And it's not that that was a bad vision, it was just that it was co-opted and taken and made into a new meaning which was fluffier um, and, and didn't actually meet their original demands. And I think we can be in danger of seeing that happen too with land back. So Mark Miller, who's the minister of, I think it's Crown Indigenous Relations, you know, in a press conference, and it's the first um, elected official I could find, at least, that said, um, you know, it's about land back. We, it's time we give land back. And everybody on Twitter, you know, was like, oh my gosh, Mark Miller said land back. He gets it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then, like, he was pressed further on to say, like, what does land back actually mean to you? What does that look like if you were to put it in, like, to, to a policy? And he was like, well, we could do more of the addition to reserve process. We could make land settlement agreements go a bit faster. 
there is a couple of things about that is one that that's not the whole scale of transformative change that land back demands, right? And then also it's still saying that Canada gets to tell us that they can give us our land back, not that we just ask for it and it's given, right? And respected. We're asking for something a bit different here. I think it's something to be wary of. It was amazing that land back came from like a meme, I think. It came from like one guy in Winnipeg who just like saw something that no policy or inquiry did, and he made it into something, into this movement, right? Um, or as part of it. We have to make sure that we're not just having this day of online organizing, that it can't just stay and live online, right? Leanne Simpson, when she was a part of Idle No More, folks might remember from 2012, is how the online organizing let them reach huge groups of people, yes, but it also made their solidarities fickle and surface level. And when it came time to have hard conversations, they were really unable to do so because they didn't have the relationships necessary to actually have those conversations in a good way. And not to say that they can't be done online, but we should be aware that that is often a pitfall of online organizing. This is my last little bit here. Um, and I just wanted to get ahead of myself because whenever I finish these talks, the number one question, the first question is always asked is, well, what can I do? My response back is always, well, who are you? I don't answer that way to be dismissive of their you know, genuine ask for help, but also I don't want to give you a lame answer that could apply to everyone, like go read the TRC or like, you know, do something like that. I want to give you something substantial. Um, and what you can do substantially is different based on who you are, where those spheres of influence that you have. We talked about earlier, Jillary talked about in her speech, right? Um, where your things of influence are, what your capacities are. One thing that we could all do even right now is I'll go through and I don't need an answer, but as I think that these are some important requisite questions to be able to answer before you begin earnestly organizing with us. And so one, can I accept hard truths? And one of them is I'm the beneficiary of colonialism. This one's really hard for people who might also in their own lives be disadvantaged in so many ways, but doesn't mean that they don't have the privilege of only having the life on this land because some people were displaced from it, right? I can and will continue to uphold colonialism in my life. So as much as we can like have this radical pedagogy and praxis of politics in our head, one of the things about colonialism is that it's all encompassing, right? It, it's everything in our everyday lives. And there's no way for us to really, in our day-to-day, -day, escape it. And so part of that is, is that we're going to uphold it sometimes. And it's going to be harmful. And we have to be able to see ourselves as both a victim of living under colonialism and a perpetrator of it. Um, and you have to be able to hold both of that at the same time. Are you willing to sacrifice your, your family, your friends, place on the social and political hierarchy in the service of anti-colonialism. And this is a hard one, and I think the, the conversations around allyship like, have gotten so fluffy too recently where it's like, I support you, <laughs> I have the banner. I don't necessarily need supporters, I need co-conspirators. I need people who are willing to put their bodies on the line every day in the way that indigenous people already do, who are willing to sacrifice in the way that indigenous people already do, even though in some ways it would benefit them not to, right? It keeps them at the top to have colonialism place for a lot of people. Am I able to enter relationships with indigenous people doing this work already with humility and grace? Maybe that talks about like not coming in to save them, not expecting that we have the answers to colonialism. I also promise you indigenous people have been thinking about this <laughs> for forever, right? Um, it's only a matter of saying, how can I, I be in relationship with you? How can I be reciprocal? How can I be in service? This one's really important to me, is do I really, truly believe that radical, transformative change towards indigenous futures are possible? It's one thing to talk about, like, burn down the government and colonialism, ah. <laughs> it's, an, it's another thing to actually, somewhere in you, really believe that it's possible to make transformative changes like that happen. And the person who really set this in motion for me, folks might know Jesse Wente. He's on the CBC all the time. He has a really good book on Reconciled. And he said, people forget that Canada is a baby country, right? We're like, what, 150 some years old? As far as countries go, that's pretty young. And he said, if only a couple generations ago, a whole bunch of guys didn't think it was too crazy to build a country, why is it always so radical for us to believe that we could change ours? I think that that's a, an important message, right? Um, about if you can, you can talk about it, you can donate, um, but what we really need is also vision and will. The next step is to ask, who am I? What roles can you take up? How can you substantially support indigenous liberations? Is it with your time? Is it with your money? Is it with your access? 
countering and challenging colonial expectations in your personal, professional, social life, even when the stakes are high. We can all do it when it's National Indigenous Peoples Day and talk about things. Um, it's something else to do it the rest of the 364 in your, in your very personal places. And also leaving yourself when you're not the best person to do that work is another thing. I think it applies to everyone, not just Indigenous people, but all of us in movements, um, is that like when you believe in something I know so fully, so heartily, when you want change so bad, it's really um, easy to become drunk on the perception um, that all you need to do is stay longer, put it all in more, um, when in fact that might not be the case. And that's a hard truth to accept as well, um, but I think is a necessary one for this work. So the last thing I'll leave you with is to remember that liberation is not a goal, it's not a line in the sand. It is a place. And this is something that geographers, maybe Ruth Wilson Gilmore, um, folks might recognize that name. She talks about that liberation is a place. They're active, real, tangible worlds that we build. It's a practice of building those worlds. Um, it's not just a dream. That is my plea to you to move beyond reconciliation towards liberation. And here's um, some bibliography if folks want to know where any of those things came from. So, miigwech. I have a question about land back. Our government in Alberta a while ago, they designated a bunch of the northern part of the province as like provincial park uh, for conservation, largely connected to the fact that it's, it's where the oil sands are and there's obviously a lot, of, a lot of destruction of the environment. That land is now managed by indigenous people for conservation, land-based practice, but it's not land back in the way I think you're talking about it. But I don't really understand fully what land back is is really because you're saying you know it isn't just hey you know the government's going to give us the land you sort of said it in a funny way so what is it then so the way i know my elders would say it first of all i have two ways <laughs> and whichever one resonates i hope uh, might answer my elders would say is they'd put back to the original they'd go back to a time before we had what we had now to i think make imagining easier so go back to like the two row wampum belts for example in haudenosaunee territory where the deal was is that um the land would be shared and then the authority over it would be um also split um far more evenly, I suppose, than it is now, those separate jurisdictions would be respected between each other. In essence, you know, one wouldn't have the power to like give it to the other or take it from the other in that way, but if there were gonna be exchanges, they were done um, on the basis of consensus, on the basis of, of collaboration, so, you know, things can still happen and move, but not in the way that they, they move now. And so that's how um, my elders would describe it. Another one I would think of is that like in the same way that we respect the laws of the land, from the powers that be right now, as we understand exclusively of the Canadian government, it would mean also bringing back up and rising into prominence indigenous law and governance. And then also we'd have to find ways, I think, um, to make them compatible with some parts of the Canadian state. And I, and I think that that would require radically transforming you know, the Canadian uh, legal and justice and, and all those systems. Uh, constitutional law here, we're, we're talking about ripping it open and you know, changing a whole bunch of things. So it's like a huge, huge transformation for sure to make that actually possible, but is what it would be. And then in the, that same way that if you are in indigenous territories, a place uh, observing indigenous law, that you would be holden to those laws in the same way that you would now Canadian laws, for example. There are some indigenous people that have like way more even radical views than I who would say all gonna go back to indigenous people we're gonna have like a complete dissolution of Canadian uh, influence and autonomy and power I kind of love it but I think about even if that was like the original intention that our ancestors even had, and I, I don't think it is, um, but there might be some sections of indigenous people who would argue that. I fall more in this like maybe middle ground of like some sort of shared but requiring huge sessions on the part of, of Canada. You use the term settler, and I would like to understand the use of the word settler, the dictionary definition oh. of settler, and how we apply it to the Canadian citizens today. And in regards to land back, we got to understand that Indigenous people are the real sovereigns of this continent. we got to realize that Canada is not a sovereign. It's not even an actual country. It's a proxy corporate governing system of the Queen, the Crown. And even today, 
The crown is merely a concept. Okay, but the definition of settler is one I find useful because it's a squabble I often have <laughs> with non-Indigenous people. I end up using them pretty interchangeably between settler and non-Indigenous, but I think when it first rose in popularity, it was to really make front and make clear the relationships that people had, that different bodies had to the land and to um, power on the land, right? Um, is that settler was supposed to talk about, not necessarily, did you physically settle here? Um, which is, is, I think, maybe one definition of it. And, but a lot of people will then say, but I'm sixth generation Canadian now and I didn't settle. And like, that's always <laughs> the, the line of logic that I get back. Um, and it's more about um, your role in the long history of settlement, right? Do you fall on the side of the beneficiaries of settlement? And if it's so, yes, you're a settler, is kind of how the logic goes. And it's supposed to make you uncomfortable and supposed to make you think a little bit about your place in that, in that history. There are certain people that I exclude, and I think it's important to exclude from that definition of settler, which is the people, especially black folks, especially refugees, because it also, settler talks about autonomy and power, right? Um, were, did you get here because you're part of a long line of autonomy and power and privilege. Um, or um, when we're talking about black folks, right, for example, um, it was a forced displacement that brought them to this continent in most cases, and that uh, they don't benefit from settler colonialism in the same way that white bodies do. Um, and so that relationship to the land, to power, is different um, than it is for other people. And so it's, I, I use non-indigenous as well if like, you know, if, the, if I feel like it in the context calls for it, but that's how I understand the, the term to me. We're talking about the hard truths of how do you continue to uphold colonialism and how you will continue to uphold colonialism. What would be the opposite, right, is if you don't benefit benefit from colonialism, then you're an indigenous person. And if you're not, then you're kind of the latter, right? Is, there's like a logic to it. I don't know if I believe in this anymore, but maybe some people will find this interesting, is that I used to say this line to people when they'd get mad at me about using either, especially using settler, is that I would say like, I could call you a colonizer, right? The difference being like settler doesn't have that same connotation of like maybe deliberacy that colonizer does. Like now when I call people a colonizer, I'm like, you're acting colonial AF in real time upholding systems of oppression. Whereas when I use settler for folks, I approach it with like a much more like neutrality. But anyways, I don't know, I haven't talked about that in a long time, it's an old idea but um, is one that I, I found would, would resonate with people and make them think of like the ways at different times and at different places our relationships to power is different um, and what we do with that power is different. Um, and so there's, there's a real usefulness, I think, in, in all of that. Um, so thank you for bringing them up. I'm curious if there are kind of exemplars for you of a liberation practice, either in other places in the world, at other periods in history. Are there mm. sources of inspiration for you that you look to as examples or you look to as just a sort of a source of inspiration for, it's not as though that things have to work that way exactly, but they're an example of the kind of liberation practice that you're describing. The one that I hear a lot about that Indigenous folks talk about when I ask them that, about like, what is your vision of liberation? How would you know liberation if it smacked you in the face? Like, have you ever felt it before? I wasn't privileged enough to be there in a way, but uh, Standing Rock is something that a lot of people bring up to me. Um, so in North Dakota, the Dakota Access Pipeline, um, folks for, I think, almost a year created like their own little community, basically, um, where it was Indigenous law um, that they created for that space about what was the role everyone was going to play there. They created systems of conflict resolution. They created um, systems of care for the children in the camp. Everybody was welcomed. And they said it was the first time, or maybe the only time in my life, so many people have said, that felt like um, I was living in an indigenous world. That if I really just suspended my belief for a second, I could pretend that I wasn't living in a colonial state of the United States, um, and that we were free in this way. Um, and it modeled in this little microcosm of, of what a liberated future could look like for a lot of people. Um, and just the way people talk about it makes me so envious, and like also so like, oh. <laughs> I think we all have access to like little pieces 
pieces of liberation in every day to get like maybe a little bit more like would it be somatic or like psychological. I think we especially feel it like in relationships with each other, like our best relationships in the outside world. Even if we have different access to power or different identities of power, that people feel truly equal, that they've created something between the two or three or however many of them where they can, yeah, work through conflict, where they can celebrate together, where they can give together. I understand that as liberation. And so I think like everybody in some way has some access to that. It's just a matter of, yeah, how we make that on bigger, bigger scales, if it was to make it a feeling. Learning about the truth and reconciliation, I thought so much of it was about the residential schools. Learning more about it's certainly more than that. And I can't remember all the recommendations that, that were put out. The land back is a big issue, and I think that's important. Our new premier has put in there a new Alberta Sovereignty Act, like to remove Alberta from Canada. As an Albertan, I'm thinking I'm Canadian first and Albertan second. The Indigenous people, the three chiefs of the three territories came out recently on the news and said that they're against that act. And I think that's great for them to speak out, but what could I do, what can we do as Albertans to support them? Because it's their land originally, it's not our land. And one that really resonates, because also for some background context, this is something I've thought about a lot because my partner's um, a Newfoundlander. And so if folks know Newfoundland as well, um, there's also the sense of, I'm a Newfoundlander first and not a Canadian first. And there's like people who are pro and anti when they join Confederation and all those things. The relationship uh, to Indigenous people, different there. But yes, anyways, something I've thought a lot about. And I think it goes to what this like gentleman behind you that asked me one of the questions earlier was saying about sovereignty, right? And how we can choose to follow maybe like the letter of these laws of could you technically in this abstract sense have a right to do that? Maybe, like you could make that argument, but like in all principles of who we want to be and who I think what democracy is and who we should be and what sovereignty is and all of those things that no, you do not clearly, right? So there's some indigenous folks that have written extensively about this in Quebec. One person I'd recommend is his name is Chad uh, Cowie. Um, and he talks about, yeah, a Quebec separatist movement. His basic plea to say that in order to recognize fully why this is wrong, you have to understand or have a greater understanding and then respect for indigenous sovereignty than we do. I think that on the personal level, there's that organizing and that education to say like, you have to have enough education about indigenous sovereignties and about indigenous histories on the land to then translate it to others around you in your spheres of influence to say, and this is exactly why we can't, right? Like whether or not we have like also personal ideas about what it means for me as an individual, I think that there's, uh, that's one instance, a perfect example of where we have an opportunity um, to center anti-coloniality in, in our lives and in our discourses. That would be kind of my recommendation. And if you needed some help on maybe how to phrase that in the best ways, Chad Cowie is the one coming to mind. You quoted uh, Leanne Simpson as saying that decolonization must take place on our own terms. Canadian u universities today are supposedly in a process of decolonization. Much is made ab about that. I'm a skeptic, having retired from university, to the extent that this process is real, or is it just merely cosmetic, merely symbolic, so that university executives can check off these boxes, report back to the government and to the board in terms of accountability that we're actually doing it. But meanwhile, the universities more or less remain the same and little changes. And I agree. And it comes down to my understanding of decolonization, which is to use the phrase from Eve Tuck and, and Wayne Yang, is that decolonization is not a metaphor for diversity and inclusion. Decolonization is like an active process of dismantlement of, of coloniality. And that like there are people who would say, and I largely agree with, is that we can't decolonize colonial structures. We can build anew. Um, we can, yeah, tear down and build a new or build a new alongside. We can indigenize colonial structures in some ways, maybe put indigenous principles and indigenous representation and, you know, indigenous worldviews more center in colonial institutions, but that they can't be decolonized that way. That's something I agree with. It really grinds my gears every time somebody says, you know, we're decolonizing X, Y, and Z. It's like one of those, like, buzzwords that has come up recently for sure in the last like five years or so that I think has been progressively watered down once again to mean something that it wasn't originally intended to be. This 
is to say also, right, if we want to take it from the academic to like a larger space is a perfect way to say like, can we decolonize Canada? <laughs> No, right, by that logic, is that we can do things to make Canada maybe different and better, um, but that ultimately it will create would mean creating way more space, eliminating parts of Canada, building new parts. Um, maybe we can indigenize, but we can't decolonize everything. And this urge that we're going to do that, and somehow I think that makes people feel like they're doing it way more progressively than reconciliation, I think is also part of that, um, isn't, isn't possible in my opinion. You mentioned Glenn Courtauld's work as well on, uh, was it grounded normativity? Mm -hmm. I just wonder if you could like expand slightly on it. what that is, what does it mean, what does it do as a kind of a principle? Grounded normativity, he has like a, a really like technical academic uh, definition of it that like I feel like I can cite from having to quote it in a bunch of things. To me, I understand it as basically a principle of making meaning based on specific context and specific place. Um, and so for him, he uses the example of being Dene and saying that in the Northwest Territories, and so saying that what is normativity for in a traditional Dene sense is different than it would be for me as an Anishinaabe person, for example. Um, and that we need to be taking into account those different perception, those, first of all, different worldviews, uh, those different senses of normativity, leaning into them in those places where they are grounded is my sense of it in like maybe the most comprehensive way. I've recently spent some time in Haida Gwaii. I thought it was beautiful when they actually had a ceremony where they gave the name of the Queen Charlotte Islands back to the province and said, mm -hmm. here's your name back. This land is now called Haida Gwaii. And I thought that uh, as an example of how that moves forward, but I wonder in unceded territories in BC, what is the difference in the dialogue of decolonization compared to those that are under treaty and the legal connections to treaty and the responsibility of that. It's clearly two different dialogues that are going on right. in unceded territory and treaty territory. And I'm mm. just curious about your concepts of that. Yeah, it's good. Getting into treaties is always, I'm like, that's a whole other talk. <laughs> and also is one I'm so nervous to have in the prairies because I don't know um, if there are, how many prairie natives there are in the room, but like the conceptions of treaties in the prairies is like way more, I guess like, somebody described it to me once as like more orthodox, but like that they are like, the sacredness of the treaties is something that's really instilled. Whereas like, I'm from Treaty 9 territory and my great great grandfather is even the treaty signatory. And so many of the times we're like, you know, screw the treaties. They were, they were, um, or in many ways, screw the treaties. They were uh, negotiated under duress, that they are not actually reflective agreements of what we want our relationships to be. They're just kind of what we have. And so uh, the, the uh, perception of treaty varies very greatly, I've found, <laughs> depending on which nations you're from and, and um, sort of uh, the context there. It's different depending on if you're in a place like, say, BC that's going under th modern treaty negotiations, and it's been taken like years and years and years to get any movement anywhere in BC on getting these treaty negotiations in place um, about how uh, we in the contemporary day are going to share the land there. But at the same time, I think that there's also a misconception that treaty lands are ceded, is that treaties don't mean like that we gave up land, I think is like a misconception on the part, not only of just Canadians, but on a lot of like government decision makers and people who interpret the treaties, um, is that they see them solely as like a session document, whereas they're all supposed to be, as I understand them, the grounds for relationality and the principles for relationality. And instead in Canada, they've somehow been like, this is what you agreed to give us, uh, which is, you know, not how I understand them at all. Maybe part of the answer to and how to reckon that gap is about transforming our views about what treaties are. And one of the things that I have really um, advocated for in the spirit of um, treaty scholars like John Burroughs, um, who talks about the um, Royal Pro Proclamation or the Treaty at Niagara, and where there were at the onset like, all of these principles of coming back, the treaties of living documents that were supposed to be come back to be renegotiated, to be evolving with the chimes that changed that just Canada never actually lived up to those, you know, expectations that indigenous people clearly outlined. Um, but that maybe it's still possible to do that, I would think. I would love to see more conversations about treaty making that don't happen specifically between indigenous governments and non-indigenous governments, right? Because if treaties are about relationality, as I said, I think they are, 
and if they're about the terms of living relationally, there's nothing that says that we can't make that with each other. Um, with you know, non-Indigenous people and other people we want to be in solidarity with or in community with. There's nothing to say that we can't take up that practice, um, but it's not something that we do, and we seem to only think about it in these very strict governmental legal terms nowadays. Um, and so maybe a revival of the fullness of treaties um, could help to bridge some of what we see in terms of how people perceive them and yeah, what that looks like. Okay, well, thank you so much. There was so much in your talk. It was, it was so rich. So could you join me in thanking...